Okay, so yeah, so last time we uh, we did the paper airplane stuff, and the point of the paper airplane stuff obviously was not to talk about folding paper airplanes, but to sort of think about okay, algorithms, uh, what are they? How do we implement them? Um, but more importantly, how do we sort of describe them? Uh, what's sort of the, the the language, if you will, that we use? Um, and so what I want to do today is, well, starting today and then and then continuing uh, for the next you know few days, uh, is talk about what we'll call uh, control structures. So every programming language, to to really even be a programming language, has to include in some way, shape, or form certain kinds of structures that allow you to basically program any algorithm that you could want okay so uh what are these things well uh you need to be able to declare stuff okay and then what makes computing really computing is the presence of an if then kind of construction right so you do this in in english all the time right uh you know what happens if your check tire light comes on in your car What do you do? Huh? Check the pressure. Maybe it needs air. If it needs air, you put air in it. Right? Not exactly rocket science. Okay. But if something is true, you do something. And otherwise, if the, the air pressure is normal, then, well, you don't do anything. Right? There's no need to. Uh, okay. So... Uh, conditional expressions would be something like that, and they can be a little bit more um, uh, exotic, right? So they could be something like, you know, go to the store, and if they uh, if milk is on sale, buy a gallon. Otherwise, just buy some orange juice. I mean, that's kind of a silly example, but where it's you know, you're making a decision to do go one way versus the other, okay? Um, and then the the third thing that we, we sort of talked about with um, uh, using the Lego uh, instruction books as the example would be on occasion you want to do a certain procedure and repeat it however many times. Uh, maybe a specific number of times that you know in advance, maybe uh, a number of times until some condition is met. Uh, and so we'll, we'll talk about how you can do uh, that sort of stuff. And then um, to really throw your brain into a tizzy, we'll talk about recursion, which is my favorite, uh, but uh, tends to give guys headaches. So uh, the days that we talk about recursion, make sure to bring some ibuprofen with you because you will have a headache afterwards. So anyway, uh, all right. So let's kind of look at what this would look like, uh, these sorts of expressions in um, – in most uh, or in in Python, for example. So, if um, let me just open up a console here, okay, and I'll pop into. Oops, no, I do not want Python two. I want Python three. Python two. Um, all right. So. Um, what sorts of things might we want to be able to declare uh, in the course of programming? So um, in the the folding the paper airplane part, did anybody say something like, let the paper be like this? Or did anybody actually specify what size of paper to, to use? You just said, get a piece of paper. Okay. So there's some sort of built-in imprecision there, right? Because how do you know that, like, dude bro isn't going to use, like, uh, one of those little quarter sheets that's been laying around? You don't, right? Uh, so you might have to say, okay, I want the size of the piece of paper, like the height of the paper to be blah and the width of the paper to be blah, whatever those numbers are. Okay, so in, in programming... This would be uh, basically saying that there's going to be a variable, and we'll call it whatever we want to, 
And then we could say what its value is. So if I say something like a equals 5, b equals 3, c equals 2.6, I don't know, I'm just making up numbers here, um, then what have I done? Okay. So those three instructions, what, what's true now? <laughs> Yeah, so I've declared the existence of a variable called A, and its value is 5, and B is 3, and C is 2.6. Okay, great. And so now, any time in the program that I write an expression involving A, B, and C, then whatever those numbers are, are going to get plopped in, in place of A, B, and C. So it's kind of like, you know, algebra, right? If I give you some big formula involving A, B, and C, like the quadratic formula, for example, and then say, okay, here's what A, B, and C are, do it. Well, then great, you can do that. Um, so, and yeah, so like, for example, I could do, uh, you know, just add them or something, right, whatever, uh, and then it's going to give me the, the output. Uh, okay, uh, these don't obviously have to be numeric things, okay? They could be text things, they could be... Um, you know, something more exotic, like let sound file equal this particular, you know, piece of music or something that you've chosen, uh, if, in, if you want to be really fancy. But, you know, for the most part, for at least getting, getting going with this, it's, it's mostly going to be numbers or text or, you know, something kind of like that. Um, now, one thing I don't like about Python, uh, it has a lot of really nice benefits, but one of them that I don't like about it is when I said A equals 5, okay, and then later said C equals 2.6, well, how are those things actually encoded on the computer? Right, so if I wanted to encode 5, how would I do it? Don't make me get my stick and come around and start beating you guys over the head. Okay. Well, what kind of number is five? Yeah, okay, so am I going to encode it as an integer? How many bits? Well, we need to decide that. Okay, Python has decided that. Okay, but one of the things that I don't like about Python is it sort of hides how the stuff is actually encoded. Okay, so for example, the number 5, is this encoded as an integer or as a floating point number? Is it at all clear to us right now? No, we know that the number 5 is an integer, but that doesn't mean it's encoded as an integer. Maybe it encoded it as 5.0, sort of in the background. Yeah. Um, but what about, say, C being 2.6? What does that definitely have to be encoded as? It's got to be a float because you can't do 2.6 as an integer. Okay, now, how many bits? Well, probably 32 or maybe 64, okay, whatever. But it's not really specified here, and we don't know. Okay, now let's contrast this with a different language. Um, so let me just kind of plop him here. And let me open up another terminal. And let me scooch here. All right, so. All right, so hang on one second.
Okay, so just wrote this simple little program. Okay, so in C, whenever you declare the existence of a variable, you have to declare what kind of thing it is. Okay, so this is one of the things that's, like I said, it's both nice and horrible about Python is that you don't have to worry about it in Python. It just sort of takes care of it in the background. But in something like C or Java, some of these languages, you have to be a little bit more careful. All right, so I've declared here A and B as integers, and C is a floating point number, okay? And uh, in uh, C, at least on this particular computer, because it's a 64-bit machine, uh, if I say int, that means 32-bit, and if I say float, that also means 32-bit uh, float. Uh, if I wanted 64 bits, I could do that. I would change int to long int and float to double, and that would make it 64-bit uh, instead. Okay, but, but there's even a distinction between 32 and 64-bit. Okay, now, uh, if I want to run this program, so let me... Uh, Okay, um, it added the numbers together. Okay, 10.6 looks good. Now, strictly speaking, I've kind of committed a sin here. Um, and let me go back into the program and let's see what that sin is, although it kind of was forgiving. A plus B plus C. What, have I, what kind of numbers have I added together here? Two ints and a float. And you can't just do that, okay? Uh, what do you have to do to add two ints and a float? Well, what you really have to do is first take the two integers and convert them to be as floats. And then, once all three of them are floats, you can add them together, right? So you can only add like kind of objects together. And if they're unlike, then you've got to convert some of them. Uh, to, in order to do the operation. So here, the fact that A plus B plus C, I type that in, but never specified, hey, convert the, the A and B to be floats instead of ints, um, is, um, uh, well, okay, basically what happened is, w when I quit the program, or quit the editor here and I type GCC, what that does is it takes code and then it spits out an executable that we can run. And the compiler, that's what that program is called, um, basically it analyzes your code and says, oh, he, he, he meant to, to convert data types here for sure. So it just did that for me, okay? Uh, and which was kind of nice, right? I'm actually a little surprised it didn't throw an error at me, um, but, because uh, I would have expected it to, but uh, whatever. Um, and uh, there we go. Okay, so we've declared things and we've made a statement. So in this case, like I just uh, said, print something, no big deal. Okay, uh, so is that all right? Okay, so the next thing I want to sort of talk about are functions. So if we go back to computing, or sorry, to math class, what is a function? Okay, so let me go back to my little document here. So in math class, what's the definition of a function? And of course, we're going to contrast this with what computing class uh, definition of a function is. Oh, come on, how many of you guys are in calculus right now? No, there's a few of you. Did you all hang around for the gates of thon Yeah. Well, you just raised your hand. Why don't you offer the answer then? What's a function? Well, okay, often, yeah, with those are the letters we do. Anything else? Yeah, men?
Okay. Yeah. So for you, you put in X's, you get out Y's. Okay. Let's be slightly more general than that. It's a rule that assigns to each member of the domain a member of the codomain. Okay, so what are some examples of functions? Well, let's just take one from math class, something like f of x equals x squared, right? So you put a number in, you get a number out. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, is it possible that you could put two numbers in and get a single number out? Sure, right? What about if you had uh, something like... Something like this. Okay. Uh, now, doing dealing with those kinds of functions in calculus is a little bit more exciting. Uh, is anybody in Calc 2? No? Is anybody in linear algebra? No? Okay. Anyway, uh, you can do calculus with these functions. It's just more exciting. Okay, so we got in... We put in two things, and we got out a single number, right? X squared plus Y squared is a single thing. Uh, can you get multiple things out? And that's kind of a trick question. I've deliberately worded that poorly. Can you get multiple things out of a function? Not really. Okay. So I'll give you a good example. What's the square root of 9? Ah, okay, well, we just have the argument. So now you two have to come fight to the death over whether or not it's 3 or 3 and negative 3. So which one is it? So the square root of 9, is it 3 or is it plus minus 3? Mm, it's just 3. Okay, here's why. What's true about a function? A function can only return a single value for a given input. Okay. Now, graphically, what's the way that you uh, explain this? If I draw the graph of something, how do you know it came from a function? Exactly. Okay. And so if the square root of 9 is both plus and minus 3, then if I drew the graph, I'd have a vertical line that would go, uh, well, the, the line would be x equals 9, and it would go through y equals both plus 3 and minus 3. Well, that fails the vertical line test. Yeah? So that wouldn't be a function. Okay. So, for a given input, you can only get out at most one output. And I say at most here because, well, what's the square root of negative 9? It's not a real number. Okay, so if we're restricting our attention, as we often do in calculus class, to only real numbers, then there just isn't an answer. Okay, and that's okay. Um, now... Okay, so uh, the square root thing, let's just say that. So square root of 9 is 3, not plus or minus 3, because a function can give at most one output for a given input. Okay. However, we could do something like this. Oops, bad habit. Okay. So here, am I giving more than one output? Okay, so when I say cosine t comma sine of t, what am I making? I'm making a point, like an ordered pair. Okay, so while it may look like that's two answers, it's really one answer with two parts. Okay. Maybe that's a little bit too subtle of a distinction for 8 in the morning when nobody's had coffee yet. But is that okay? Yeah? Okay, so, great. Computing class. What is a function? So what do you guys think?
Well, okay, first off, do you think everything that's a function in math class is still a function in computing class? That would be kind of nice, right? So that's true. Okay, so everything that's a function in math class is also a function in computing. The definition of function becomes slightly more general in computing. Okay, uh, in the following way, functions in computing They don't have to actually take things in or spit things out. Okay, it can just be a list of instructions. Okay, so for example, um, I could make a function that just declares the existence of A, B, and C. Is there really any input to that? No. Is there really any output to that? Well, no, not really. Okay. Huh? Well, okay, uh, yes, there could be a scope problem. Um, but, uh, but if I did, like, okay, let me, uh, uh, yeah, or like, let's say that I had declared their existence so that they're in scope and then the function just initializes their values, right? Then they're, they're still in scope. Okay, so if you have no idea what we just said, don't worry about it yet. Uh, who's gonna be CS major minor? thinking maybe none of you why am i even here right oh kids these days um okay because english majors don't like to take math classes i guess that's the real reason right because cody what what are you majoring in history, history. uh-huh okay where are the rest of my seniors yeah History? History. Okay, yeah, well, this is proving to be a popular major. Um, and, oh, and who's the Mason that is in the history major? Uh, who's senior this year with you guys? Mason? Gas. Are there two of them? Okay. Well, who, which one delivers pizzas? Okay. Yeah, because I think, what was it, Friday night last weekend or Saturday night? I don't remember which one because, well, I was pulling a Cody and I had a little drink and it was late and I was hungry, so Domino's to the rescue and yeah, so anyway. Really? Well, and he's delivering pies? Wow, yeah. Because he, he came in and he's like, yeah, you have a good rest of your night. I, I told him that. And he's like, yeah, I got to go back and work on my history senior sim paper. I'm like, on Friday night? He's like, yeah. I was just like, man, Warner is really running you guys hard. At What are you in two different sections of senior sim or something? Okay. Ah. Hey, you best be you best be careful what you say when it comes to Professor Rhodes. Okay. Because Oh, right, right. Okay, because yes, Professor Rhodes could uh you know turn you into a pile of broken body parts. Um, no. Yeah, you don't you don't want to mess with her. Uh, one of these days I'm just expecting her to ride up on a Harley. Right? <laughs> Make for a good photo op, but yeah. No, I love Dr. Rhodes. I uh, a few years ago she took me with her one of her classes to Paris uh, for an immersion trip over Thanksgiving break. It was fantastically awesome. I had a great time. Yeah. So, no, I mean, it was great. Now, you, you man, does she walk fast. Whew, it was enough to keep up with. Um, yeah. No, we had a really good time in Paris. Uh, 
and we ate like kings. So, as one does. So, anyway, and then the pandemic happened and nobody could travel. All right, so back to what we're here to talk about. Functions in computing need not take input or output. They can, okay? Um, so, you know, I, I could call a function, like, function make lunch, okay? It doesn't have any input in the sense that there's no, like, I'm not giving it numbers or something to work with, uh, or maybe I am. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have output in the sense that I'm not returning numbers or anything, okay? So maybe my instruction or function is like make lunch for X number of people, okay? And you're in the fraternity house, and uh, I don't know, what do you guys tend to have for lunch? Trash? Okay, well, I suppose that depends on the frat. Which frat? Ah, uh, yeah, that's the alternative, right? Well, if you want to eat like kings, right, we've already established you go to Fiji because uh, daddy's got the platinum card. No? All right, anyway. Um, so you could say something like make lunch for 10 people, and let's say that lunch is going to be, oh, I don't know, BLT sandwiches, Okay. So what would the instructions be? Well, you would make the appropriate number of sandwiches, and then the function would terminate, and there you have lunch. Okay? Now, often, though, functions do take input and return output. They just don't have to. So a function can be sort of shorthand for a list of instructions. Okay? Is that all right? And we'll look at a lot of examples of these as we go. So, like, for example, let's go back to Python. Um, and let's just make a function. Okay, so Python was over here. All right, so let's make a function okay. So now if I type my func of one, two, three, what's going to come out of that? Six. Okay, great, the sum. All right, so this, is a, this would be an example of a, a function that's kind of like a math class style function, right? In math class, I would have written this as something like f of a, b, c equals a plus b plus c. Okay, or whatever I want to call them. Uh, now, one thing I think we're really bad at doing in math class is in math class variables and functions what are they named what do we name variables what do we name functions in math class there's sort of some conventions to it but what like what kinds of things do we name functions and, and variables Yeah, we use letters. Okay, great. Uh, X, Y, Z, A, B, C. Right. What what kind of letters do we use for functions? Typically, e X and Y possibly, or F and G and H and things of that sort. Right. Uh, every now and then the Greek alphabet gets involved. Right. So, for example, if you have uh, angles, often we use Greek letters for those. Doesn't have to be, but that's oftentimes what we do. Um, but point being, we typically in math use a single letter for any variable and any function's name. Single letter, right? And this is why we sometimes have to resort to using the Greek alphabet because, of course, how many letters are there in the English alphabet? 26, okay? That's a fair number of letters, but it's not, not enough. Okay, so we throw the Greek ones in there. And you know you're having a really bad day when the uh, Hebrew alphabet gets involved in math, okay? Because it means you've run out of two alphabets worth of letters and you're now on your third. Yeah, no? It's not, not as bad as it seems. Um, yeah, okay, but we, always ever, we only ever use one letter for any variable or any function name in math class for the most part. Do we have to? 
Like, is there some rule that thou shalt only use one letter for variable names? No, it's just that typically that's fine. We don't need more than one letter, okay? Now, in computing, though, uh, quite rarely do you use a single letter, at least for function names. For variable values, yeah, we still do, like A, B, C, but I don't have to. I could make it like DX equals 2 or uh, width equals 7 or whatever. It can be kind of whatever, whatever you want it to be. Um, okay, uh, so yeah, uh, that's maybe one slight difference. And uh, I, I think the reason that we have to do that in computing is because there's it, it, particularly if you're writing a big program, there's going to be way more functions and you want to be a little bit more descriptive as to what you're, you're working with. Whereas in math class, like let's say you're doing a, a particular calculus problem, well, there might only really be one or two functions that you're worried about at the moment and maybe three or four variables. And then you get to the next problem and everything sort of resets and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Okay, but if you were right, like, oh, I don't know, writing your dissertation in mathematics, then maybe this would be a big, bigger problem. Okay, so I, I think we mathematicians don't do a very good job of saying that, you know, functions and variables can be called whatever you want them. It's just that for convenience in math and because of lack of necessity, we usually just only use a single letter, okay? But in computing, that's sort of a bad habit to, to get into, particularly with function names. Okay, so that's how I define this function in Python. Let's look at how I might define it in C. Um, and so let's go over to the other thing. Okay, so something like this, and then let me um, let me change what I'm printing here to be my func of a, b, c. Okay, all right. So first off, what's the difference here in terms of how I defined it? Well, in C and other languages like that, I have to say what's the name of the function? Okay, my func, fine. What kind of data comes in? Three pieces of data, and what are they? A and B and C, and each one of those I've said is a float. Okay, and what goes out of this function? Another float. Okay, the value of that float will be whatever A plus B plus C is, but I'm taking in three floats and returning another float. Okay, and then down here, when I've got the printing command, what number am I going to print? I'm going to print whatever the thing coming out of this function is. Okay, which, what would we say? It was going to be 10.6 or whatever is what we should get. Okay, so does that kind of make sense? Yeah? All right. Oops, that was not what I meant to hit. Okay, there we go. And again, I'm a little surprised it didn't throw an error here because what kind of uh, number were A and B? They were ints, but I passed them to a function that expected to be getting floats in. The compiler was nice and just dealt with it for me, okay? And in fact, here's a way I can find out what the compiler really did. Um, Oops. Yep, that's exactly what I thought it did. Uh, okay, so <laughs> what you're looking at there is what's called assembly. Uh, which is lower level even than C, or very much lower level than Python. 
Uh, all right, it looks like complete gobbledygook to you guys, right? Who knows what it is? Well, so um, has anybody ever actually programmed an assembly before? In assembly? That's what this is, right? Machine language. Uh, okay, so uh, in this case, uh, the, the numbers A, B, and C, right? A and B were what kind of number? They were integers, okay? But if I pass them to a function that's expecting floating point numbers, I have to convert them to floating point numbers, okay? Now, did I ever tell the program to do that conversion in either Python or uh, C? I never explicitly said to do it, okay? But the compiler picked up on that, that I have sort of mismatched data types, and so you see my cursor is on this instruction FCVTF. That is a integer to float conversion function that's, uh, that's present. And you'll notice how many times did it get, uh, get used? Okay, but I had three variables. Why didn't it get used three times? Because one was already a float, so it didn't need to get converted. Okay. So yes, yeah, so this this what the compiler did was basically it's smarter than me, uh, and said, okay, I just need to convert the data type to from one kind to another so that you can actually do the arithmetic. Okay. Um, and why did we go from int to float rather than float to int? We could have done that. Okay, but what would have been the problem with this particular program if we went the other way? Well, what was one of the numbers? Two point something, okay. So if I convert that to an integer, what's necessarily got to happen? The point something goes away. Okay, now, in the case of 2.6, do I make it two or three? Well, we could argue about that, right? If you're rounding, three would probably be the answer, but there are definitely cases in, um, uh, or lots of cases where you always want to round down or always want to round up, and we have two names for those functions. They're called the floor and the ceiling, respectively. Okay, so it's like an always round one direction kind of thing. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, anyway, the computer was smarter than me, and realized that it needed to do some data conversion. All right, good? So let's come out of this. Um, so what about a conditional expression, okay? Um, so conditional expression is gonna be anything that's of the form if, blah, then, blah, kind of thing, right? So if you are, uh, I don't know, out of milk, what should you do? Maybe put milk on your shopping list or go to the store and buy more, okay? And so let's say you go to your fridge and there's a nice fresh gallon of milk in the fridge. Are you going to go to the store and buy more milk? Not according to that instruction. You would just not do anything, okay? But let's say you go into the fridge and there's nothing. It's completely empty. There's not even any beer because Cody showed up and drank it all. Okay, then what? you go to the store and buy milk, right? Or beer, <laughs> or whatever, right? Uh, so, so what would be uh, sort of an equivalent of this? Well, like, let's say that the value of a variable is equal to something, like, for example, let's say if uh, a equals five, oops, Womp womp. I know. They'll just hire anybody. Yeah. You fool. You fell for one of the classic blunders. Okay. So, I just gave it an instruction, or a pair of instructions here. If A is equal to 5, print A equals 5. What happened? Did it print A equals 5? Yes, it did. Okay. Why did it print A equals 5? 
Well, what was the value of A? Five, okay, right? Now, let's, let's decompose this, the, what I wrote here, okay? So initially, what did I start typing? If A equals five, right? And then it yelled at me because I made a, a boo-boo, okay? And how did I fix it? I put a second equals there. Okay, so this is kind of a picky detail, but it's one we have to deal with on computers quite a bit. What does the symbol equal mean? I know, it almost sounds like such a stupid question when you say it, but yeah. It's equal, to, yeah. I know. You can't use the word equal if I'm asking you to define equal. Yeah, okay. So we use the symbol equal in two different senses mathematically, right? We use it to assign the value of something, okay? And in math, we typically also have English words with this. So I might say, let x equal 7, okay? That's different than saying, uh, if x equals 7, then we know that the perimeter of the triangle is greater than 12 or whatever right, just some statement, okay? So in math, we use equal in two senses. We use it as an assignment symbol, okay? Let x have the value of seven. And we also use it to say, well, is x equal to seven? Yes or no? Okay, that's ambiguous. And if there's anything that computers don't like, it's ambiguity, okay? So in computing world, we have two, we need two different symbols for this. And the convention is if you are assigning the value of something, you use a single equal. Okay? So up there at the top, right, I had A equals 5, B equals 3, C equals 2.6, and so on. Okay? If I want to check whether or not something is in fact equal to something else, the convention is that we use double equals. Okay? So, and, and then the difference here is the double equaled version is something that is either a true or false statement only, right? The number A is either equal to five or it isn't, okay? Whereas saying let A equals five is a different thing, yeah? Okay. Um, and in this case, why did the, the, the print instruction actually get executed? Well, because the condition that A was equal to 5 was true, all right? Whereas if I did something like, um, so let's change it, and let's say if A equals to 3, print A equals 3, Did anything get printed? Why not? Condition wasn't true. Okay. All right, now I can spice this up a little bit. Okay, so what did I throw in here? The else statement. Okay, so A is either equal to 3 or it isn't, right? And what I've specified here is what to do if it is equal to 3 and also something to do if it's not equal to 3. Okay, so this you know, this little four-line thing, right, this is a program, and A has been defined up above, okay, so I hit this, and I say, all right, is A equal to 3, yes or no? No, so do I do this one? No, I skip over to the else case, is, if A is equal to 3 is false, then I go into my else case, and I do whatever is there, okay? Now, you don't have to have an else case, Okay, so for example, like let's let's take the, the milk. You open the fridge, it's empty. If there's no milk, go buy milk. Okay, do I have to say what to do if there isn't or if there is milk in the fridge? 
what would you do if there's milk in the fridge? Do you need to go buy more milk? No, don't need to, okay? Uh, now, you could get fancy and say something like, if there is less than two gallons of milk in the fridge, then go buy more milk. Okay, so you open up the fridge and there's a gallon sitting there. What are you going to go to do? Go buy more. Okay, so let's say, and this is maybe a little contrived, right? But let's say you go to the fridge and there is an unopened gallon of milk. Okay, and then, so what do you do? You go buy another gallon. You put it in the fridge. Okay, so now there are two unopened gallons of milk. Your roommate comes in and wants to make a bowl of cereal. So he opens the fridge, he removes and, and uses the milk, and then puts it back. But you see that there's now less than two gallons of milk. What technically should you do? Go buy another gallon, right? Okay, so uh, yeah, that's maybe a little bit of a ham-fisted example, but does that kind of make sense, right? All right, so recap, what do we talk about? Declarative expressions, functions, and we'll talk more about those. Um, and then also conditionals, right? So things of the if-then variety, okay? Um, and uh, one thing, and, and I've used here Python quite a bit for a couple of reasons. Python, writing Python code looks like writing English in many respects, okay? And that's kind of nice because uh, you can just look at it and you kind of know what it means. Okay, whereas something like C, where there's curly braces and things are a little bit more, like it's, it's a little bit less human readable if you don't already know how to read it. Okay. Um, okay, and then what was the last sort of important point here? What's the difference between single equals and double equals? Single equals does what? Assigns a value to a variable. Okay, what does double equal do? checks whether or not two things are the same okay all right uh i will see you guys on monday have a good weekend